Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hello everybody, this is Griffin with the Command Valley bringing you a new episode of Duel of the Peaks. This episode we're going to be showcasing the new pre-cons from Zendikar Rising, and also two decks that we've built on our own that are also from Zendikar. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing it, please check the link in the description box below where you can actually go to GameGrid's store, order singles, and the pre-cons right now for $40 for both or $20 for one. Another way to support the channel directly is to head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley, check out our awesome benefits and exclusive content, and sign up today. Like I said previously, today we're going to be showcasing the pre-cons from Zendikar Rising, the Land's Wrath and Sneak Attack decks, along with decks that Len and I have built on the same power level to make for a really interesting game. Without further ado, Landon, will you go ahead and introduce our decks and challenges? Hey guys, Landon here. I'm going to be going over the table challenges for this episode and the personal challenges for each of the decks. So the three point challenge, like normal, is going to be casting your commander exactly once from the command zone. The two point challenge will go to the person who has drawn the most cards in a single turn. And the one point challenge will be to deal combat damage with two creatures at each opponent throughout the game. With the table challenges out of the way, let's go over the opening hands for each of the decks. And I'll also be going over the personal challenges when I go over the opening hands. So going first, we have Peter playing the Anawan Ruin Thief pre-constructed deck. And he kept a hand with three islands, Dwar Isle Refuge, Scourge of Fleet, Endless Obedience, and Fairy Vandal. And his personal challenge is to mill a creature from each opponent in the same turn. Next up in turn order, we have Caleb piloting the Obun Moldaya Ancestor pre-constructed deck. And Caleb kept a hand with a Mountain, a Naya Panorama, a Croson Verge, a Myriad Landscape, Retreat to Kasandu, Mina and Den Wildborn, and Omnath Locus of Rage. And Caleb's personal deck challenge was getting a land above 7 power. Next up in turn order, we have Griffin piloting his Tazri Beacon of Unity deck, and he kept an opening hand with a Farseek, a Notion Thief, a Forest, a Treasure Nabber, a Plains, an Island, and a Leonin Relic Warder. And his personal challenge was to have a full party for an entire turn cycle. Then we have Landon piloting Kaza Royal Chaser, and he kept a hand with a Mountain, an Island, a Merfolk Trickster, a Soul Rink, a Sower of Temptation, a Seagate Oracle, and a Reality Shift. And his personal challenge was to discount an instant and sorcery by six mana, including alternate casting costs. With the deck introductions done, I will be going over the points as they stand right now. We have Peter in first place with 46 points, Griffin in second with 41, and then Landon with 22, and tailoring last is Caleb with 21 points. Without further ado, let's begin the game. So starting the game off, Peter draws and plays down Drawer Isle Refuge as his land for turn, and when that land enters the battlefield, he gains a life and he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb draws and plays on Croson Verge as his land for turn and then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays on a forest and passes to Landon. Landon draws and plays on an island and taps that island to play a turn one soul ring. Peter untaps and draws and plays on an island as his land for turn and taps two mana to cast his fairy vandal. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a tapped myriad landscape as his land for turn and passes the turn to Griffin. You might think that these tap lands are a pain to, to Caleb, but the thing is, with his landfall deck, these, these lands are going to be very useful for him later in the game, so you might see him hold off on cracking those. Definitely. I would almost consider these like fetch lands in his deck, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> They're that good. Powerful effects. All right, Griffin goes to his turn and draws and plays down another forest as his land for turn. He then taps both of his lands to cast Farseek, searching for a mountain and putting it into play tapped. He then passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn. He then taps both of his lands to cast his commander, Kaza the Royal Chaser. With his commander on the table and with nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a swamp as his land for turn, passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down Naya Panorama as his land for turn. With his slurs land out, Caleb does not have any colored mana, which is why he passes the turn without playing anything. Yeah, actually, I 
Crimson Verge doesn't tap for colors, does it? No, it does not. I thought it did. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. All right, Griffin goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays on a planes as his land for turn, and taps two of his mana to cast a Gruel Signet. He then taps the rest of his mana to cast a Treasure Nabber, which is not nice with my Sol Ring. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping that you would uh, uh, use this Sol Ring so that I could get advantage off of it. No. <laughs> That's not how it works. With nothing left, Griffin passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn and taps three mana for a Seagate Oracle. When it enters the battlefield, he gets to look at the top two cards, put one into his hand and the other on the bottom of his library. With nothing left, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn and he taps out to cast his commander, Anawan. He then goes to combat and swings the Fairy Vandal at Griffin. Griffin takes two damage and goes down to 38. When Fairy Vandal deals combat damage to Griffin, Griffin, Anawan is going to trigger milling Griffin for two, and since a creature was milled, Peter gets to draw a card. Fairy Vandal triggers, seeing Peter having drawn his second card this turn, and it gets a plus one plus one counter. It makes sense for Peter to swing at Griffin, because Griffin is playing a deck that is heavily involved with creatures, so there is much more likely a chance that Peter will get that trigger off of his rogues. Good point. In Peter's end step, Caleb responds by basic land cycling Sylvan Reclamation for a forest and puts it into his hand. With no further game actions, Caleb begins his turn, untaps and draws, and plays down the forest that he just cycled for, and pays 3 mana to cast Retreat to Kasandu. And with nothing else, Caleb passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down Mystic Monastery, tapped as his land for turn, and goes to combat, swinging the Treasure Nabber at Caleb for 3 damage. Caleb declares no blockers and goes down to 37. Griffin then casts his commander, Tazri, Beacon of Unity, and with nothing else, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and taps Kaza to make his next spell cost two less, since he has two wizards in play, and then pays two more mana to cast Ral's Outburst, dealing three damage to the Treasure Nabber, and then Landon gets to look at the top two cards of his library and puts one of them into his hand, and he puts a mountain into his graveyard. And with nothing else, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays on an island as his land for turn, and taps two mana for Una's Blackguard. He then goes to combat, swinging the Fairy Vandal at Landon and Anawan at Caleb. Landon takes 3, dropping down to 37, and Caleb takes 2, going down to 35. Ana 1 triggers, seeing rogues deal combat damage, and Landon mills 3, and Caleb mills 2. Caleb mills a creature, so Peter will draw a card, and Fairy Vandal will get a plus 1 plus 1 counter for Peter drawing, and then the Una's black card triggers, making Landon discard a card. That is a very hefty toll to, to be triggering so soon in the game, stripping cards off of players' hands, especially with these decks that don't have a lot of card draw. That's that's a heavy hitter. In his second main phase, Peter taps one mana to cast Changeling Outcast, which will trigger the Una's black card, and it gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Since it's a Changeling, it's also a rogue. And with nothing else, Peter passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a mountain as his land return, which triggers his retreat to Kassandu, and he chooses to gain two life, going back up to 37. He then pays four mana to cast Mina and Den Wildborn, which lets him play an additional land each turn, and he plays down the Bounce Land Selesnia Sanctuary, returning a forest to his hand. This will trigger the retreat to Kassandu again, and he chooses to put a plus one plus one counter on the Mina and Den. Mina and Den might be one of the most powerful cards in not only Lannan's deck, but any landfall deck. Caleb's deck. Being able to play multiple lands per turn is very powerful, especially to get those landfall triggers, but Mean and Den can return lands back to your hand to play them again to get more advantage while also giving a creature trample, which is actually a, re a very relevant keyword. With no further actions, Caleb passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a tapped Selesnia Gilgate as his land for turn, and he heads to combat, swinging Tazri at Peter, and Peter declares no blockers, takes four going down to 37. With nothing else, Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and plays down a mountain as his land for turn, and wanting to hold up all of his mana, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, and plays down a swamp as his land for turn, and heads to combat. He swings the unblockable changeling outcast at Landon, Fairy Vandal at Griffin, and Una's Blackguard at Caleb. No blocks are declared, each of us take the damage, and a one triggers, seeing all of the rogues connecting, and each player mills cards equal to how much damage they took, and each of them hit a creature, so Peter will draw three cards, and Fairy Vandal will trigger and get a plus one plus one counter, and Una's Blackguard will trigger, and both Landon and Griffin have to discard a card. At this point, Peter has hit his personal challenge of milling a creature from each opponent in the same turn. In his second main phase, he taps six mana for Una, Queen of the Fae. At this point, every other player is looking at Peter as a threat. His deck is really popping off. He's got a lot of chances to make tons of rogues. He's also drawing a lot of cards. He's got the most card advantage. This wasn't something we were expecting to see from the rogue deck so quickly. It was very impressive, and it was definitely something we were all looking out for. In his end step, he has to discard a Demir Guildgate to hand size. 
Caleb untaps and draws, and pays 4 mana to cast his commander, Obun. He then plays a forest as his land for turn, which will trigger Retreat to Kasandu and Obun, and he puts 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Obun. He then plays a Plains as his second land for turn, which will trigger Obun and the Retreat to Kasandu again, and he puts both the plus 1 plus 1 counters on Obun. He then goes to combat, and Obun's ability triggers, and he gets to turn a land into a creature, and he turns Myriad Landscape into a 7-7 with Trample and Haste. And he hit his challenge very quickly. <laughs> Probably should have upped that a little bit. Yeah, well, we, yeah, it was kind of hard to tell. <laughs> Caleb then goes to declare attackers and swings Mina and Den at Peter and the 7-7 seven, seven Myriad Landscape at Griffin, and neither of them declare blockers. So Peter goes down to 32 and Griffin goes down to 27. I think we were all anticipating that, like, all of the decks would have a lot more interaction than they really did. Um... Like, I don't think we were expecting any of our threats to, like, actually stick around for as long as they did, so. Definitely. It was also a very big surprise that both playing the pre-cons got off to a very quick start. These these decks are quickly becoming large threats, and Lennon and I are just sitting back here holding up cards, trying to figure out how we're going to catch up. Yeah. In Caleb's end step, Griffin activates his commander, paying five mana to look at the top six cards to find a creature in the party and put it into his hand, but unfortunately he doesn't find anything. That was the absolute worst thing that could have happened in this deck. There are about 40 party creatures in this deck, so there was a high chance that I was going to get one and a, and a good chance I was going to get two, but getting none, paying six mana for nothing, that is not a good feeling. Especially because you probably held up that man. You probably had other things you could have done on your turn too. It does feel really bad. I think both of us were like kind of stuck on something. Like I only had one island and all of the cards in my hand had double blue pips. So that was like really sucky. And then it just seemed like you and I were having a really hard time like getting anything going. <laughs> Griffin goes to his turn and untaps and draws and taps three mana for Champion of Lampolt. He then taps four mana to cast Brian Stoutarm. This will trigger the Champion of Lampolt and it'll get a plus one plus one counter. He then goes to his end step and Landon responds by casting Reality Shift targeting the Una. This resolves and Peter will manifest the top card of his library. This was a very good play for the rest of the table. Una is a, is a large threat and was going to start pumping out rogues like nobody's business. So Landon being able to respond with that reality shift. I believe that there was nothing worse. There was no worse creature in his deck than Una, Queen of the Fae. Yeah, but I later I really started wishing I would have hit like Caleb's lands or something. But since I only had one blue mana, I had to be kind of strategic with when I cast those spells, you know. It was kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> Absolutely. It was a tough call to see what threat was going to have to be taken care of. But at, at definitely at this moment in time. I, I think Uno was the correct decision, though. So it would have been nuts. Because <laughs> they all would have entered with plus one plus encounters from Uno's Black Guard. And then they all would have been pumped by Anawan. And none of us had... I mean, I had one flyer, but like for all intents and purposes, they were all unblockable. Yeah, it would have been really bad. <laughs> I think it was the right play. Yeah. Landon goes to his turn and untaps and draws and pays three mana to cast Beacon Bolt targeting Anawan. It will do five damage to Anawan since Landon has five instants and sorceries in his graveyard and this sends Anawan back to the command zone. Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn and pays four mana to cast Master Thief. When it enters the battlefield, he steals Landon's soul ring. In response, Landon taps it, so when Peter gets it, it is tapped. The ironic thing here is that you casted that soul ring on turn one, but you never used it. No, I didn't use it ever. No, I think I used it for the uh, Seagate Oracle, maybe. No, you purposely didn't do that, I believe. Yep, you never cast it or you never tapped it until Peter tried to take it. Peter goes to combat with his newly acquired Soul Ring, but he can't swing with it because it's not a creature. He swings the Fairy Vandal and the Changeling Outcast both at Caleb. Caleb declares no blockers and takes six damage going down to 29. The Una's Black Guard will trigger and Caleb will discard two cards, which he discards Living Twister and Inspiring Call. He then taps the rest of his mana to cast Whisper Steel Dagger, and in his end step, Kayla responds with tapping and sacrificing the Naya Panorama to go and find a basic mountain and put it into play tapped. This will trigger his commander and the retreat to Kassandu, and he puts a plus one plus one counter on both of his creatures. Caleb moves to his untap step and draws and plays Needle Spires as his land for turn and gains two life from the retreat to Kassandu and puts a plus one plus one counter on Obun. He then pays five mana for Keeper of Fables and heads to combat. He then goes to combat and using Obun's ability animates the Myriad Landscape into a 9-9 trampling hasting creature. He then swings the Myriad Landscape and Obun at Griffin. It's important to note that even though Peter was the largest threat at the table, there are still points involved. So that's why Caleb is swinging all around the table trying to get those points. And this just shows the uniqueness of the Duel of the Peaks in the point system. 
Griffin decides to use the Champion of Lampolt as a chump block for Oboon since Oboon doesn't have trample and he takes 9 damage from the Myriad Landscape Land going down to 18 life. This will then trigger the Keeper of Fables seeing a non-human creature deal combat damage and then Caleb will draw a card. He then plays a Mountain as his second land for turn and this will trigger his landfall abilities and he will gain 2 life and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Mina and Den. And with nothing left he passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a tapped Nomad Outpost as his land for turn and taps 2 mana for Leonin Relic Warder. And when that enters the battlefield he targets the Retreat to Kasandu and exiles it until the Relic Warder is gone. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and delves away 5 cards from his graveyard, tapping one of his lands and tapping Kaza to reduce treasure crews down to just 1 blue mana and draws 3 cards. He then plays down an island as his land for turn and taps one more and taps one mana to cast Wayfarer's Bauble. And then with nothing else, he passes his turn. This is a little too little too late for me. Yeah, but it's, it is to note here that Landon did discount a spell by 6 or more, getting his 2 point challenge. Peter goes to his turn untapping and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn and then taps 6 mana to bring his commander back out into the game. Now that Peter has casted N1 from the command zone for a second time, he loses the 3 points he gained from casting N1 the first time. This is one of the uh, the decisions that you have to make in Duels of the Peaks, where you either go for points or you either go for a stronger deck strategy, including your commander. Peter at this point decides that he would rather have N1 on the battlefield to get him that card advantage than get the 3 points for not casting his commander more than once. Ana1 will enter with a plus 1 plus 1 counter from the Una's Blackguard, and then Peter heads to combat, swinging the Fairy Vandal and the Changeling Outcast at Landon for a total of 8 damage, and with no blockers, Landon goes down to 26. This will trigger Anawan and Landon will mill a total of 8 cards and there is a creature among them so Peter will draw a card and a plus 1 plus 1 counter will be put on the Fairy Vandal. Landon will have to discard 2 cards from the Una's Black card trigger. And with nothing left, Peter passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws. At this point, I make a deal with Caleb, asking him if he only swings the Keeper of Fables at me, then I would not block it so he could get the card draw. I was very worried that at this point I would be taken out of the game simply because the amount of lands that were coming onto the battlefield each turn would make it so that the land would just get big enough that even if I blocked it, it would take me out of the game. So with this deal, hoping to avoid taking that much damage, I, I make that deal with the Keeper of Fables. Caleb then taps 7 mana for Omnath, Locus of Rage, and then plays down Gruel Turf as his land for turn, bouncing a forest back to his hand and triggering all of his landfall things. He gets a plus one plus one counter on a boon and a 5-5 five, five elemental from Omnath's trigger. He then replays the forest as his land for turn and gets the landfall triggers yet again, putting another plus one plus one counter on a boon and creates another 5-5 five, five elemental. He then pays two mana to crack the Crows and Verge, finding a plains and a forest both into play, triggering his landfalls again, putting two plus one plus one counters on a boon and two 5-5 five, five elementals. This is what I was referring to earlier about the power of those sack lands. When you have a landfall deck, even though you can't use those at the beginning of the game, the value that you can attain just like Caleb later in the game is just monumental. He then heads to combat and Obun will trigger and he turns his force into a 13-13 creature and he does uphold the deal with Griffin and just swings the Keeper of Fables at him and swings Obun, Mina and Den and his land at Landon. Landon blocks Oboon with the Seagate Oracle and takes 20 damage, dropping down to 6 life, and Griffin goes down to 14. This will trigger the Keeper of Fables, and Caleb will draw a card. You're a man of your word. In Caleb's end step, Griffin activates Tazri and gets an Archetype of Imagination and Mangara of Corridor and puts them both into his hand. Probably feeling pretty good that he was able to hit two creatures with this trigger to make up for the last time. For the last time, definitely. And actually, all, I believe, five of the six cards that I pulled off the top of the deck were were party creatures and so it was really tough griffin goes to his turn untaps and draws and pays three mana to cast the mungar of corindor and then in his end step landon cracks the wayfarer's bauble finding an island and putting it into play landon untaps and draws and holds up all of his mana and passes the turn to peter peter untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land return peter equips the whisper still dagger to his changeling outcast and then heads to combat and swings the fairy vandal the changeling outcast and the una's black card all at caleb for a total of 13 damage and caleb takes all 13 of it dropping down to 20. caleb mills 13 cards from anawan's ability Peter will draw a card, Fairy Vandal will get a plus one plus one counter, and Caleb will have to discard two cards from the Una's Black Guard trigger. This will also trigger the Whisper Steel Blade, so Peter can cast a creature from Caleb's graveyard, and he chooses to cast the Armorcraft Judge for four mana. 
With the Armorcraft Judge on the stack, Griffin responds by flashing in a Notion Thief, stealing the four cards that Peter would have drawn for the Armorcraft Judge, for seeing four creatures with plus one plus one counters on them. At this point, I am digging for one of my interaction pieces or board wipes because Caleb and Peter were both massive threats. I was more scared of Caleb at this point in time. But Peter was still still a force to be reckoned with. Len and I were both feeling like at any point just we could be taken out of the game. Definitely. That was a good notion, Thief. It was not the best one, but it was a good one. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and casts Admonition Angel, and then pays two mana to crack his myriad landscape, finding and putting two forests into play tapped. This will trigger his landfall abilities twice, putting two plus one plus one counters on Oboon, getting two more 5-5 five five elementals from Omneth, and then he exiles Anawan and Master Thief, using the Admonition Angel's landfall ability, and this will give Landon his soul ring back, tapped. He then pays two mana, activating Mina and Den, returning the Gruel Turf back to his hand to give Obun Trample until the end of the turn. That is extremely relevant, just like I said, the Mina and Den's Trample ability is not to be trifled with. Obun at this point is is massive, I believe at this point he was an 18-18, or something crazy like that, um, or no, he was 15-15 with Trample. Uh, Landon and I are, are dead at this point unless there is some interaction that will be had. So when the Gruel Turf enters the battlefield, he returns a mountain back to his hand. The landfall abilities will trigger again. He puts a plus one plus one counter on Oboon, bringing it up to a 16-16. And then he gets another elemental token. He exiles his own armor craft judge that Peter has with the Admonition Angel. He then goes to combat, animating a mountain into a 16-16 creature, and swings four elementals, Omnath and Mina and Den, all at Peter, and swings Oboon and the mountain at Griffin, and swings Keeper of Fables at Landon. Peter responds with the best timed Aetherized I've ever seen in my entire life, and bounces all attacking creatures back to their owner's hand, effectively wiping Caleb's board clean, leaving him with only four elementals and an admonition angel. That was a massive play by Peter. Returning all of these to, to Caleb's hands means not only is he losing all of those elementals, but he has no more mana to cast any of these spells, which means he's just been time walked an entire turn with no attacks. That is like, that is the dream. Like when you put Aetherize in your deck, that is like the dream. <laughs> That's what you want from an Aetherize. That is, what, that is what you want. And Peter knew this. Peter held this mana up because he knew that Caleb was going to try to end everybody on the same turn with all of these massive creatures and definitely knew what he was doing with that Aetherize. I think Peter would have been pretty dead. This definitely changed the course of the entire game. Oh yeah, definitely. And this next turn also changes the course of the entire game. Feeling very sad about his combat step being blown out, he passes his turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down Murkwater Pathway as his land for turn, and taps 6 mana to cast Archetype of Imagination. It'll enter and give all of his creatures flying and make all of his opponent's creatures lose flying. He then taps 2 mana to cast Mikaos the Luminarch for X equal to 1 and it gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter. He then goes to combat. Griffin then swings all of his available creatures at Caleb for a total of 13 damage, dropping Caleb down to 7 and Griffin gains 4 life from Brian having lifelink. Landon taps 3 and Kaza to cast a Comet Storm X equal to 2 and it's kicked 4 times, targeting Leonin Relic Warder, Notion Thief, Mangara of Corridor, and Archetype of Imagination, dealing 2 damage to each of them. Griffin responds by tapping the Mangara to exile the Whisper Still Blade, and then Comet Storm will resolve, killing his creatures. And when the Leonin Relic Warder dies, Caleb gets his retreat to Kasandu back. It felt like the right thing to do, because I was like, I'm dead to Peter, and I'm dead to Caleb but I think those two are gonna go after each other and I was afraid that you were gonna kill me next turn. So I was hoping that if I were to take you out and make you look more appealing than me, that they would kill you instead. <laughs> this is a very fascinating turn of events. It started off with Caleb, um, who just dropped an entire board and then Peter just slaps him right in the face with that eighth rise. Then I play an archetype and slap Caleb in the face and then on my end step, I also get slapped in the face by Lannan. It's been a very, very twisty, turny round of the table. Lannan goes to his untap step and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn and taps four mana to cast Sower of Temptation, gaining control of the Admonition Angel. He then pays three mana and discarding a card to jumpstart Beacon Bolt back from his graveyard, targeting the Fairy Vandal, dealing eight damage to it. And with nothing left, he passes his turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays on a Swamp as his land for turn and taps 7 mana for Scourge of Fleets. When enters the battlefield, it's going to bounce all of his opponent's creatures back to their owner's hand. This was essentially just a Cyclonic Rift, and 
everybody, everybody at this point is feeling very, very let down and broken. Caleb losing all of his elementals and having to recast Omnath, me losing my entire board, and Lannan also losing the Admonition Angel that he had stolen means we were all left open, so now it was just a matter of Peter choosing who he's going to take out. When the Admonition Angel leaves play, Peter will get the Anawan and the Master Thief back, and when the Master Thief enters the battlefield, he will gain control of Soul Ring. Caleb will also get his Armorcraft Judge Bat, and then Anawan and Master Thief will both enter the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter due to the Una's Black Guard. Peter then goes to combat and swings for seven at Griffin, and Griffin declares no blockers because he has nothing to block with, and takes seven damage and goes down to 11. Anawan will then trigger, milling Griffin for five, and there is a creature in there, so Peter will draw a card, and then Griffin will have to discard a card from him being hit with a creature with a plus one plus one counter on it from the Una's Black Guard. And with nothing else, Peter passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and taps 6 mana to recast his Admonition Angel, and then pays 4 mana to cast Mina and Den. He then plays a Mountain as his land for turn, gaining 2 life from the retreat to Kassandu, and with the Admonition Angel's Exile trigger, he takes the Una's Black Guard. He then plays down a Mountain as his second land for turn, gaining another 2 light from the retreat and choosing to exile Anawan with the Admonition Angel's ability. He then pays the rest of his mana to cast his commander from his hand again, Obun. What a wild, wild turn from Caleb. The power that he was able to put back onto the battlefield right when his board was just completely wiped just shows the power of having more lands than your opponents. Griffin goes to untap and draws and plays down a planes as his land for turn and then taps four mana to cast the Zir of the Menagerie and then taps two more mana for an Izzet Signet and then pays the rest of his mana for Tazri and with nothing left he passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and pays two mana to cast his commander from his hand and then pays four more mana to recast the Sower of Temptation, stealing the Admonition Angel again. I will note here at this point that Landon, Caleb, and Griffin do not lose those three points because the requirement for those three points is to cast it from your command zone once and then not cast it from your command zone a second time. Since these were all bounced back to their hands, playing it again did not cost them those points. Peter untaps and draws and plays down Command Tower as his land for turn, and then pays a hefty 9 mana to cast in Group's Wake, wiping out all of his opponent's creatures. This kind of makes me feel like the, the tribal game that we played where I just had all of the board wipes in my hand and I was just casting them over and over and it was hard to just, just catch up after that and that's kind of how it felt like here. We spent our turns replaying our hands and then in this, in Group's Wake, it, it, it's already hard to come back from one board wipe and it's especially hard to come back from a second one well especially when that board wipe is not symmetrical right so like the person that cast it wasn't affected at all um i think that was like the nail in the coffin <laughs> yeah that's the second time that peter casted a spell that affected all of his opponents but not him um extremely powerful play yes very powerful with the admonition angel dying from the in group's wake he gets Anawan one and una's black guard back and Anwan will enter with a plus one plus one counter from the Una's Blackguard. He then goes to combat and swings the Scourge of Fleets and the Master Thief and his 2-2 manifested creature at Griffin, and then swings 3 damage at Caleb. With no blockers, Griffin is forced to take it and goes down to 0, and Caleb takes 3 going down to 8. Anawan will trigger, Caleb will mill 3 cards and discard a card, and he did, dis he did mill a creature so Peter gets to draw a card. Rip in peace, Griffin. Rip in peace. Rip in peace, Tazri. Never she was used once. <laughs> Do you, do you think that, like, it wouldn't have been too powerful if her activated ability, if you had a full party, you could just put the creatures into play? Like, I feel like there should have been, like, at least one more, like, line of text on her that cared about party. Yeah, I mean, that would have been really cool, and that would definitely have made her stronger. Um, Tazri is just not a powerful commander. I don't think so. Like, I kept looking over, and I'm like, man, she really doesn't do anything. <laughs> like, I'm not afraid of her at all. Yep, it was more just a flavor deck. And yeah, it's definitely hard playing a deck centered around a theme that has just come out from one set, going against three other decks that have themes that have been going on for for over 15 years definitely. in Magic's history. Yeah. I, I would say that Tazri was the weakest deck on the table by far. But your deck did a lot more than mine. Like, I think... I never had more than three or four non-land permanents on the battlefield throughout the whole game. We were definitely the the yeah uh, the the in the backseat of this game. I will tell you though that that Una's Blackguard I think deserves to be the MVP of the game because like it stripped away a ton of cards from my hand that would have been super important late game, but I pitched them because I just didn't have the right mana to cast them. What did you pitch? Like the sigil the sigil tracer, so I could have copied um 
my treasure cruise, I could have copied the Comet Storm. I discarded the Merfolk Trickster, which could have tapped down something and um, I could have traded up or something like that. So I had to pitch a negate and I had plenty of mana. I could have negated the in Grook's Wake. And then on the one milling us cards too. I mean, it was just, the deck was really good. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Peter then goes to his second main phase and pays four mana and taps two of his creatures to Convoke Endless Obedience, and he targets the Admonition Angel in Caleb's graveyard and puts it into play under his control. That poor Admonition Angel has just <laughs> been all over Passed the place. Passed around like a rag doll. Yeah. And then with nothing left to do, Peter passes his turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and pays seven mana to cast Omnath, Locust of Rage again, and then taps three more mana to cast Absan Falconeer. He then plays down a Plains as his land for turn, triggering his retreat to Kasandu. He's going to gain 2 life going up to 10, and he makes a 5-5 elemental with Omnath's ability. He then pays 5 more mana to redeploy the Keeper of Fables, and with nothing left, passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws. He then uses the Aftermath ability on Memory from the Commit to Memory spell in his graveyard, and makes everybody shuffle their hand in graveyard into their library and draw 7 cards. He then plays down an Island as his land for turn, and casts Merchant of Scroll, and when it enters the battlefield, he will draw a card. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Peter. Glennon at this point attains the most cards in one turn with his draw step plus the seven cards from the memory and then the Merchant of Scrolls. He is at a total of nine. Didn't find anything good. <laughs> Peter untaps and draws and plays down a Rogue's Passage as his land for turn. And this will trigger the Admonition Angel and he will exile Omnath, Locus of Rage. He then activates the Rogue's Passage to make the Scourge of Fleets unblockable and heads to combat and swings Admonition Angel at Landon and the rest of his creatures at Caleb and finishing them both off, taking them down to zero. They are dead. Rip and peace, and peace, Caleb and Landon. And there we have it. That is the gameplay, including the pre-cons from Zendikar Rising. Honestly, the entire game, it just seemed like the two pre-cons that were, were just trumping the entire board. I don't feel like I, I was able to keep up with those decks. And I have to say, I seriously underestimated them. I, I would have to agree. I think it should also be noted that we did, in our deck building process for both of our decks, we did make an effort to kind of tune them down a little bit. Just like as a precaution, because we weren't quite sure how these precons were going to play. But I think even if I had brought my Kaza deck like fully upgraded, like as, as it was in the deck tech that I did, I think it still would have been a very similar outcome. Absolutely. So talking about the play of the game, personally, I believe that the play of the game was when Peter played the Aetherize on Caleb's board. Caleb was was in the position to win long before uh, uh, Peter Peter won that game, and and it's because of that Aetherize that just single-handedly nuked Caleb's board that kept everybody else alive, including Peter. Oh yeah, I doubt that we could have <clears throat> with I doubt we could have done anything to deal with Caleb. Um, Caleb's Not at board all. State. So I think that was the biggest game-changing play. What do you think, Landon? I I would agree with that too, or the Scourge of Fleets, because Caleb was able to like rebuild after the Aetherize and was still threatening. Um, I think it was that Scourge of Fleets, like like second bounce that not only dealt with his board, but your and my board uh, together. Absolutely. Yeah, Peter just had all the answers in that game. Yes. Three board wipes. <laughs> Three board wipes. It's crazy. So talking about the most powerful card or the MVP card of the game, uh, Lennon did allude to it before. Lennon, do you want to talk about what you, what card you thought was the, the MVP? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of cards that, like a lot of um, candidates for the MVP of the game. I think Una's Blackguard is one of them. I think that card did a lot of work, like kind of behind the scenes, almost making us discard cards while Peter was also drawing cards. That was kind of brutal. Definitely. My pick for the MVP card of the game is actually going to be Anawan. I feel like Anawan just kept Peter's hand filled. That's why he was able to play so many so many of those answers, and he was able to just keep the the the, ch the train rolling. He never ran out of gas, and, and even at the end, he was able to, to, to pull off the win. Definitely. fairly. I was pleasantly surprised how few times he actually milled, or sorry, how few times he whiffed with Anawan, um, not milling creatures from his opponent's decks like he even milled creatures from my deck and i'm not even playing very many creatures <laughs> yeah he he drew he i mean he drew something like eight or nine or eight to ten cards off of anawan and and that in itself that just that just is so much advantage including yeah. Yeah. including buffing up all of his rogues which did which did more damage which made made a big difference during the game so now let's tally up the points from this game Peter is now at 52 points, 3 points for winning the game, 1 point for dealing combat damage with 2 creatures to each opponent throughout the game, 
and two points for hitting his personal challenge of milling a creature from each opponent in one turn. Caleb is at 26 points, three points for casting his commander once, and two points for his personal challenge of getting a land to at least seven power. Griffin is at 44 points, and he got the three point challenge of only casting his commander once. Landon is up to 31 points now, having gotten three points for having cast his commander once, and two points for drawing the most cards in a turn, and two points for his personal challenge of reducing a spell by at least six. So even in this game, Peter having one did not earn as many points as Landon. Landon earned a total of seven, and Peter earned a total of six. And and that just shows how these these plays in Duel of the Peaks change, and your strategies will change. Trying to get those points and, and ending up ahead, even after you don't win. Good job, Lennon, for earning the most points that game. Yeah, I will note that when I cast that memory, I wasn't actually trying to go for points. I was trying to find an answer, and uh, I don't even think I had an answer in my deck. So, <laughs> Well, a very, a very good and really fun game. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining in for this gameplay video. We hope you enjoyed it. A couple of reminders. The first, if you are looking to support the Command Valley and become a patron, then head on over to patreon.com slash commandvalley. You'll be able to support us directly and get access to exclusive content, our personal Discord, merch, and other awesome perks. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this channel and this episode. If you are looking for any cards or the pre-con decks from Zendikar Rising, either the Land's Wrath or the Sneak Attack deck, then check the link in the description box below where you will find a link to GameGrid's website where you'll be able to purchase all the cards you need, including those decks, and get them shipped right to your house. Another reminder that we are now on Twitch. We live stream Arena every Tuesday from 7 to 9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Come join us for some Brawl. I will say I have built a very sweet Akari deck that actually does some, does some work. And then last of all, feel free to check out our social media in the description box below as well. Follow our Facebook, our Twitter, and if you aren't already subscribed, please subscribe. Again, just one more quick thank you to all of our patrons and all of our subscribers and everybody who watched this video. We really appreciate you guys and we're super happy to be a part of this commander community and we hope you guys have an amazing weekend.